So did you end up going to Afghan? Went to Afghan, yeah. And how was that? Because like, honestly, I, I will say this right now. I don't think a lot of people doing it for the right reasons could, could tough that out and go through. What, what was that experience like? Uh... You know, this is actually a real honour, a big welcome to <laughs> the journeyman, the, the legend himself, Lewis Van Pooch. How are you, Poochie? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Yeah, buzzing to be here. Thanks for having me on. No, man. Thanks for being here. Bro, I mean, what a journey. Yeah. What an absolute journey for you. Obviously, recently retired now. 170 fights, right? That takes, that takes some grit. That yeah. takes some resilience. So I want to take you all the way back, right? That's what we, that's what we do here mm -hmm. on, a, on a fighter's life. We want to find out what makes you tick, everything about you. Childhood-wise... Right, and like going back to the start, why why boxing? What like, was it? Was it something from your childhood? Was it something you started a bit later? How, what happened? Um, I was I've always been I'm not the tallest of blokes now, and I definitely wasn't as a as a kid. <laughs> How tall are you, Poochie? Five six. Like, yeah, five I'm... seven on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> right shoes on, mate. Yeah. I'm a five seven. <laughs> but yeah, I was I, I was never bullied, but I was picked on. Right, okay, picked on, and uh, I, I never really know how to stand up for myself, and. Uh, yeah, I was whilst I started like playing football and rugby and stuff, I was, that toughened me up a little bit. But went down the boxing gym after watching uh, my mate Chris Higgs from Lydney. We grew up on the same street. So how old are you at this point? Uh, four, 13, 14. Okay, so quite young then. Yeah, yeah and then uh, he boxed Luke Campbell in the ABAs. We went up to Huddersfield for the day wow. on, a, on a bus from, the Lid, from Lydney. And I just loved the atmosphere. So I went, as soon as the season starts next September, I'm going down the gym. Yeah. I walked in and I've, I've never looked back. I've, I was really? hooked that, that, that very day. So amateur wise, how did you, did you have a lot of amateur experience then? Did you have a lot of fights? Did you win, did you win titles? How, how did it work for you? How did your amateur go for you? Amateur was all right. I had 36, okay. 120 of them. Um, always sort of got to the ABA quarters. Uh, most of my uh, amateurs as a, as a junior. So I joined, I, I, I literally, like, exactly how my career panned out, I had loads of fights in a small period of time as a junior. <laughs> yeah. as a, as a junior. Um, and then, I, um, yeah, then I joined the army at 16, so the boxing was on the back burner. Whoa, whoa hang on. So, okay, so you were, I didn't know this about you, right? Yeah. So you were, you went start boxing 13, 14, mm -hmm. had a bunch of amateur fights. Yeah. Okay, done reasonably well, like a, not a bad ratio. Yeah. Right? And then 16, joined the army. Yeah. Yeah, I was a bit of a gobshite at school, which might shock you. Okay. <laughs> but um, basically, I made that decision because whilst everyone was going, I've got a job, I've got um, I've got an apprenticeship, I'm going to college. I hadn't done any of that. And I was just, I was more focused on playing sports and uh, causing a, a, a fuss at school. I was going to say, what was school like? Because you said you 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 were picked on. Yeah. Right? And and you started you started to learn to look after yourself this and that. Did if you started boxing at thirteen fourteen, you were obviously still in school. Did that change your persona in school? Did that change? Like, did it give you confidence? Did it change you as you was? Hundred percent. Boxing changed my life really. Mm. Uh, not 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 in a financial sense or anything like that, but is in in terms of how I was viewed and how I was how I carried myself. It gave me a, a better lease of life. Like like I said, I was I, I got picked on. I was never bullied, but I got picked on a little mm. bit. Uh, point the fun out a little bit, um, yeah. And then I, I found boxing, and and it and it sort of changed how how I perceive myself and other people perceive me too. So then, you, like like we were saying, I interrupted you. Sorry, dude. You started your amateur career and then went to the army. And what? Why was that? Yeah, because I didn't I didn't I didn't plan to 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 do anything after school. Yeah. So I sort of made a bit of a rash decision to just join the army. So if we say rash. Um, uh impulsive mm -hmm. decision to join the army and yeah it, it suited me it suited me i had two stints in the army i joined at 16 left at 18 had a bit of unfin unfinished business i should have gone to afghan when i was younger but i decided to leave the army job hopped a little bit and then went back in when i was 20 and i stayed till i was 25. 25 yeah and did, so did you end up going to afghan went to afghan yeah and how was that because like, honestly I, I will say this right now it take, I wish I could sit here and be as patriotic and as this and as that and just be completely honest, but I think it takes a certain, per if you really know what you're letting yourself in for mm. and you've looked into it, I think it takes a, a certain type of person to join the army. Like 
to join any forces and, yeah. and, and to go in it wholeheartedly, not just not just because they've got nothing else going on in their life, but to really want to be a part of this country and do it. It takes a special type of person, yeah. so nothing but respect, because I don't think a lot of people doing it for the right reasons could could tough that out and go through it. What, what was that experience like? I, I, I really liked it. I liked the... Well, but like I said, I'd been boxing a couple of years by the time I joined the army. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty robust by this point. I, I really enjoyed working out. I enjoyed running. I enjoyed all the physical aspects of being an athlete. Yeah. And then obviously when you're in the army, that's sort of, that's your bread and butter. I was an infantry soldier. So our main thing was make sure we're fit enough to do the job. Mm -hmm. So our, a lot of our stuff was just based around fitness. And I, I, was, I just loved it. And then, like I said, I was a bit of a, bit of a, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't a lost soul or anything, but I was just a bit Jack the Lad is probably yeah, the right yeah. term. And that just sort of got out of me at a young age. So. Did, you, did you have any scary experiences in the army? Oh, well, I was in Afghan. I mean, my tour was pretty quiet when I went to Afghan because we went in the winter. And uh, historically, the uh, Taliban didn't like to fight in the winter because it's, it's really cold out there really? in the winter. Yeah, But um, yeah, we had, we had a few hairy moments, but nothing, nothing too... Major. <laughs> the words of a soldier. Yeah. A few hairy moments in <laughs> Afghan, but nah, it was all right. Yeah, it was all right. Mate, you said like, mate, you said like, yeah, I saw a scrap down the pub, but you know, <laughs> it, was, it was all fine in the end. Yeah. So you come back at 25, and then tell me how you then, what's the path to get back to boxing? So I, I was still, I'd actually turned pro whilst I was still serving the army. So when went to Afghan when I was 21, mm -hmm. come back, I, I think I just turned 22. Yeah, must have been. Must have been just turned 22. But I wanted to go and do another year in the amateurs before I turned pro. Okay. So I, 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 go, I went to my careers officer. I said, look, sir, I want to go in, on the army boxing team for a year. He goes, all right, sweet. I'm a massive boxer. I can sort out for you. But they'd just done the box off, so I'd have to wait another year. And I already had box on the back burner for, I don't know how many, four years or so, <laughs> whatever it was. And I just wanted to just kickstart my career from there. So he goes... So he said, go, if you can get yourself a professional contract, bring it to me Monday morning, we can let, we'll let you turn pro. So that's what I did. Wow. Yeah. Do you ever feel like um, the career might have panned out a bit differently if you hadn't joined the army and you would have just stuck with boxing? Or do you think it just was what it was? I think it was what it was, yeah. So like I, was, like I said, I was around boxing uh, prior. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Higgs, who I mentioned earlier, he'd turned pro um, way before me. So he, I was going to the shows and... Cosby's in the same gym, I was in the changing rooms. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing fighters like Daniel Thorpe, Christian Late, yeah. Peter Buckley, and uh, Jason Nesbitt. They're all the journeyman names before me. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing them and I'm seeing how it all worked. And uh but I was I was never ever gonna be a world beater. I was never like a top amateur and I never was gonna get signed by a big promoter. So I think my career Did you path... have that mindset before you even tried to turn over? No, no, I I'd, I'd turn pro out of um Tony Borg's gym and I'd just get absolutely peppered by Lee Selby and Corey really? Lino and stuff like that. Wow. And that, when I look back at that now, that probably helped my progression into being like a tough and rugged and mm -hmm. being able to bite down my gum shield. But that's when I realised I probably wasn't going to be like a superstar mm -hmm. or at least get like the opportunities that I, I could have got. But I thought if everything went my way, everything went my way at the right time, um, I got all the right opportunities and took them at the right opportunities, Maybe British title level was yeah. what I was looking at. Yeah. But then I that quickly realized I quickly realised I didn't really want to do that. And I didn't want to sacrifice my twenties. I lived the normal twenties. Yeah. 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 Do you do you feel like sometimes looking back because I, I, I find I find your story, Poochie, so interesting, mate. Because yeah. when I speak to a lot of fighters, they can be one or two fights in and I'm sure they've had like decorated amateur careers yeah. and you know, they've they have they have been told in their gym and they know that like they have the potential, but a lot of people I speak to, it's like world titles, they go, I yeah. want to be, it's, it's, it's rare that I speak to someone who goes, I kind of was, I kind of knew I wasn't going to be there. Yeah. I wasn't going to do this. or I wasn't going to do that. It's kind of refreshing to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, do you feel like if you would have had maybe not a bit more confidence in yourself and I know, I'm sure you'll probably say like, well, uh, not delusion, that sounds a bit harsh, but yeah. if you would have believed a bit more, you would have gone further. You could have, or do you think, no, I, I kind of, I was just realistic with it. Yeah, yeah. A bit of, of all of those things you just mentioned all come into your, your mindset because you can't go in there thinking, I'm I'm useless, I'm just going to be a journeyman. Yeah. I, 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 I had two fights at home, home corner, my first time pro. I won my first one, contentiously. Um, 
lost my second one. Just for some reason, I just wasn't there on the night and I got beaten by a, a journeyman. Then on my third fight, I took it on the road. A bit naive of me going, uh, the manager rings me, do you want to fight on Friday in London? I went, I live in Lydney, for us Dean. How, how the hell do you want me to sell tickets in a week? Yeah, yeah. And he goes, no, no you're, you're the way fighter. So I went, oh, sweet. I was on the way fighter, I just turned up and fight. So I won that fight. I thought that this is it now. I'm going to be the away fighter, but I'm going to have a bit of ambition in the away corner. So, so this is how it started. This is how it started. This is how it started. So you, the third fight you won as the away fighter. And this, the away this, fighter. Is, this is a good plan for yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely think. buzzing. Like away right. fighter, York Hall, the, the wow. home of British boxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My first time there. And then, um, so then I started taking a couple of like late notice phone calls, getting on the wrong end of some decisions. And then uh, the big one, I was my seventh fight. Curtis Woodhouse else needs an opponent two weeks do you want it so that's my make or break Eddie Hearns show win this fight I've got some bit of pulling power I get Eddie Hearns ear maybe get him to sign me that was the opportunities that, that, I've, that I've thought about prior to actually turning pro and if, if, always, if those opportunities come up at the right times you take them so I took it lost that fight and that was my make or break what am I going to do carry on or be an away fighter and I chose the latter chose the latter mate I like I said, it's it's crazy to hear it from your perspective because you yeah. look at your you hear the term journey man, right? And you kind of go, okay, a guy that's you know good enough to keep himself out of too much danger, mm -hmm. not going to be the person that you know blasts our prospects out, but you know puts on a show and everything's good and they they do their thing. <clears> I find it the, journey man feels like a, a derogatory term for a lot of fighters. Like you don't people don't set out to be yeah. a journeyman. Like you didn't set out at the start of your career to no. be a journeyman, right? No, definitely so, not. at what point do you start going? I know you like I want to be the away fighter, but at what point do you go, mate? I'm I'm a journeyman here. Like, yeah, when does like, that happen? Like I said, with the, with the Woodhouse fight, that was the that was the one. I said if I if I beat him, I push on, and I start making some waves. I start calling people's names out, and I try and get myself opportunities. I'm in the bar with Eddie Hearn after, so yeah. I'm, so that's what that's what I was willing to think it, before the fight. That's what I'm thinking. I'm in the same hotel as Eddie Earn, and if I just beat Curtis Wood, that's on his show, he's going to give me an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like I said, I lost it, fair and square. Turn, I turned up for three rounds. The, the three rounds after that, he got the better of me. Didn't didn't put me away. I went the distance. Yeah. Um, not many people can say that not, about you, mate. Not, not many people can say they put you away. <laughs> no, no, they they can't. Um, yeah. But then, uh, so then. I had a couple more fights after that, thinking I might try and push on. I think I had one more at home and it got stopped on a cut. I was like, "What? All this running around selling tickets and I get a cut?" Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And then it's that, that that was like a, that was that was technical, uh, technical knockout because it was apparently caused by a punch, but it wasn't. It was caused by air. But anyway, and then um, yeah, then I, I fought Johnny Corn on my tenth fight. I sort of got I, I was pretty tight of the weight because it was a late notice, and uh, I was I was sat in the car on the way down there and I went. I'm just going to be a journeyman tonight. Mm. Just going to see how that goes. So I hear, because I hear, like I said, the names I mentioned earlier, Nesbitts, C. Wrights, Lades, Buckleys. They all, I hear them talking about, oh, that was easy, nice work. Just kept myself safe. So I went, that's what I'm going to do tonight. He's just not a Yeah. 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 Pretty handy boxer as well was Johnny Coyle. Mm. Um, but he barely, barely got near me, really. But he won the fight comfortably, but didn't put me in any trouble, any trouble at all. And then for you, is that sort of a bit of a mindset? Because, you know, for a lot, of, we, we, we were speaking about this before, you know, for a lot of fighters, if you're not that, like, top 1%, earning enough money to kind of be like, mate, this is me set for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely fine. There's a lot of fighters out there who are, still work, like, who are high level fighters, still working normal jobs, still, yeah. you're still, doing, still doing that. And it's like, they're living the life, they're grinding, they're training, like, you know, it's everything to them. They've got yeah. no time outside of this. And the only bit of time they have to do, they have to work just to make ends meet. Yeah. So when you when you start looking at it from a journeyman point of view, and you're like, look, I can keep myself safe. I don't get knocked out. It means I can fight. I, mean, I could fight every week if there's a fight there. Yeah. Does it kind of, easy money sounds a bit sleazy, but does it kind of feel like, look, I can actually earn a decent, decent living here yeah. and do what I like to do? Yeah, it was all right. It was all right. It was like, it was, um, like I said, if you if you look after yourself, you've got some boxing skills, you can translate that into looking after yourself as a respected journeyman, then it's a good life. Does it get to a certain point though, right, where you're like, okay, I'm a I am full fledged journeyman because what 170 fights, I keep saying it, but 80 fights in, you're 80 yeah. fights in, you know you're a journeyman. This is this is this is what you're doing. 
did it ever worry you about beating someone and then that kind of stopping you having that do you know what I mean? Like knocking someone out or do something like, oh, no, you know, because now I actually want to be, I want to be a journeyman. I don't want people to think I'm better than I am. Or was there, was there any sort of mindset there? Or did you just go in and actually just think every time I want to keep myself safe, but I'm at, I am going to fight? So there's a very fine line to what you've just described. You've got a, there's no longevity in getting beaten up every week. Yep. There's also no longevity in running around the ring for four rounds, mm -hmm. not making a fight of it. So the very fine line is making a fight of it making a fight of it, winning some rounds, educating the boxer that you're fighting against, whilst making it entertaining for the promoters and the fans and everyone that's paid the harder money to be there. And I like to think I towed that line pretty well. Clearly, mate, 170 <laughs> fights later, I hope so, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but like, I, I was a bit different. Like like I said, I didn't run around the ring for four rounds. I stood in front of you, almost daring you to hit me. Mm -hmm. I had quite good head movement and I could make people miss. My ring IQ got better and better as I went on through experience. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I, and, and like, I could make a fight of it. I could fight when I needed to, if I had to get, if they, if they start getting a bit, um, full of themselves during the fight, I could bring them back down a peg mm -hmm. and that got all kinds of experience. This is all stuff you learn on the go. I was about to say, the, the thing that, that cracks me up for is that, you know, like there's the term ring rust. Yeah. You are the, op you are the WD-40 of the boxing <laughs> world, mate. You're the, yeah. you're the opposite of ring. Yeah. You were never out the ring. Never out you know? the ring. <laughs> Literally, honestly, yeah. it's crazy. By the end of your career, do you feel like you, you was a massively improved fighter? Because you have so much experience. Right? You, yeah. you must have seen every single style, yeah. uh, a lot of weights, Very much. you know, uh, from South, like Southport to Orthodox to this, to that, to different goals. Like it, it, you must have seen everything yeah. in a professional fight, not sparring. So by, by the end of your career, did you feel like a, a well more rounded fighter? hundred percent. Um, like I said, I got better and with my experience and my ring IQ, but, um, Rich, Richard Farnham was my manager and he used to just text me and say, look, I've confirmed this fight. Are you free? I say, yeah, what's he all about? Blah, 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 blah. And his line pretty much every time was quite big, but nothing you've not seen before. That's, yeah. and, that, and that is literally exactly what it was. And then end of the first round, he'll come, I'll come back, sit down in the corner, and he'll say, um, how is he? What's he like? And I'll go, nothing I've not seen before. Nothing not seen before. And that, that, was, that was it, nine out of ten. You, know, you just, you know, we're in for an easy night most of the time. When you start to feel yourself improving, and you start to be like, I'm, I'm learning a lot here, I'm getting better, was there a lot of fights you felt you could have won if you wanted to. Yeah, so so I touched on it earlier. I lived a normal 20, 20s uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I went out, drank beer, ate fast food, fraternised with women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fraternised with women. What a way to put it. Uh, Ella, love, I was wondering if you want to come at mine for a bit of fraternisation. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. You're out, you're fraternised. You're having so, fun. So, like, there's, there was times... Well, I should, I'm not fit enough to be in the ring, mm. but I'm a journeyman. I can look after myself. So there's times where I probably shouldn't have taken fights when I haven't been been fit enough. So there's there are nine out of ten, they'd fall on the ones. Like sometimes I fought with a hangover. I would never, ever condone doing this, by the way. Yeah, yeah. But but... The, fight ring, the phone rings last minute. You've had four or five pints. You think, screw it, let's take it. So then um, that nine out of ten, they would fall on the guys who are probably not up to the scratched where they should be to be a yeah. professional fighter and then i'm just like oh well a bit hungover i feel a bit fragile can't really be can't really be bothered not really been in the gym so then you just that's that they become the, the double easy nights because mm -hmm. i used to find some of the easier nights were the guys which could, which could punch yeah because they're just dining out on their power yeah, yeah and yeah. the guys who aren't i haven't really got much they're the double easy nights because you're you're literally in first gear, just looking after yourself. The guys who had all the skills, all the punch in the book, all the movement, they were the more tricky fights for me. I bet. Yeah. I bet it must be. That's, that's quite a headache. Was there ever any fights where you thought, this is <laughs> this is on a long old night. I mean, yeah. out of 170, I'm sure there are. Like, what's, what has been, would you say, was your personal toughest fight? So, toughest, toughest fight, it was a bit of a 50-50 one. I, I fought um, the Mark. Mark. It must be old too, you, you probably fought a few more. Scot Scot Scottish fella, I can't remember his name though. Anyway, eight rounder, top of the bill, uh, after Christmas. Can you make 160? <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a go. Give it a go. Yeah, so that, that, was, that was a tough fight. But um, 
some of the best fighters I've been in with. So twice, twice has happened. End of the first round, Rich gets in the ring. I'm not even sat down yet, and I go, "It's gonna be a long night." <laughs> Yeah, was, some, something bugger. I haven't seen before. <laughs> yeah. So that was Lerone Richards and Callum Simpson. Oh, Callum Simpson. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're the t- they're the top two that's pretty good. He's a big guy, Callum Simpson. And Lerone Richards. He's about 6'2", yeah. isn't he? They're big, big guys. Big, big, big blokes. So like, they're full time athletes. So they're yeah. just living. I'm, I'm weighing in at, I don't know, 10, 12, 7 to fight these guys. And that they're they're living full camp lifestyles to make that. Yeah, exactly. Way, yeah. When, when I was just literally. Just, just, just what I weighed yeah. really most of the time. Um, there was a, there was another lad recently. Um, it's right towards the end of my career, so I sort of lost a few steps. Mm. So hence why I'm get, hanging up the gloves. And he just took me apart. Like I really had to bite down on the gum shield. And he's only only on the small hall circuit. Um, Andre Desalu, his name is. Okay. Yeah, he's one to look out for. I, I really rate him. I think he's got a good future in the sport. You think you think he can do stuff going forward? Hundred percent. He just like first round he was just pinging me with the jab and I was like, oh, this would be easy. Yeah. This would be easy if he's just going to do that one. And then he went for the gears. Third round, he just absolutely peppered me, took me apart. <laughs> like, like, popped my head up with an uppercut and flipped me with a left hook. And I was like, like so people don't do that to me. Yeah. I'm good at avoiding those sort of things. Mm-hmm. And he was just, yeah, so I, the last round, he was trying a bit hard to stop me, I think. And that's when I sort of started, started reading him a bit. But um, yeah, I got through that fight. But he's one to... He's one to look out for. So, so I'd say Lerone, Zach Parker's, Callum Simpson, uh, Sam Eggert and all that, obviously. Hey, you have fought some, you fought some, yeah. in British boxing, you've fought some of the biggest names and like big prospects, you know, yeah. and you really have. You strike me as someone, Pooch, who use massively positive. Yeah. Right? So I'm going to ask you in general life and in boxing, yeah. worst moment for you. So like in professional boxing, what was like your worst moment? And you know, and if it's if it's the same for general life, and they cross over, fair yeah. enough. But like, what what have been some like some darker moments for you? I, don't, I can't I can't really tell off the top of my head. I don't really. I got I got to be honest. Nothing too crazy has happened to me. Yeah. In boxing all life, like uh, lost out on a few decent fights because of like cuts and stuff, mm-hmm. or like soft sausages. So they they they've been pretty crap dates for me, but. There's nothing really springs to mind, really. No. Nothing really springs to mind. Do you feel like, was it an easy day for you to make that decision of, you know, being the away fighter, I'm a journeyman? It, it was an easy decision for you. Because I feel like for some fighters, again, the confidence may be delusional. But if, like, you're a good fighter in your gym, you've got all these hopes and dreams, like you want to go on to achieve all this crazy stuff, and then you get a reality check when you turn over. Yeah. That must be humbling for a lot of guys. That must be really like, oh... But where you came at it from a slightly different angle, yeah. Like hearing it was like, you know, realistically, if everything went my way and it was the right thing, I might be British level. But mm, yeah, it feels like not in a bad way. It kind of served you well in terms of keeping you positive. Yeah, yeah. Like I've always had a good positive outlook on on most things. Like um, the job I'm in at the moment, I uh, had a had a someone flagged up at work the other day, and I got in a little bit of trouble. But I said to my boss, I was like, I'm very half full. And I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of people out there are pretty half empty. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I was like yeah, you're, you're right, actually. And I'll never moan or complain about anything. Well, my dad always drummed into me when I was younger, just find find solutions, not problems. Find yeah, solutions, yeah. not problems. I've always I've always lived by that. I mean, like, the, the resilience you have, mate, is like, yeah. is crazy. Because I, I just don't get 100 and, 170 fights later, I know some people, I know, again, I guess he wasn't doing all long camps and this and that where a lot of people pick up injuries and stuff. But yeah. is there any, like, did you pick up any bad injuries throughout your career? Is there anything that you thought, well, this might be the end of it? So actually, when I was an amateur, um, I was only about 15 and I've, I've still got the injury today. I threw a left hook and he tried to counter me with a, like a bolo uppercut and he hit my arm and ripped my rotator cuff. No. And... I actually stopped him with the same arm. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um but yeah, uh, that that injury has flared me my entire career mm-hmm. of as a boxer. And um whilst Richard was my manager and my trainer, he lives in Swindon, I live in Bristol. So it's an hour's drive and you'd be damned if I'm driving an hour to go to the gym every day. Mm-hmm. So I trained myself for most of my career. Rich managed me and looked after me, but I just trained myself and for years of punching the heavy bag Really took its toll on my shoulders and my elbows. Really, and I've got like mega tendonitis. 
I wake up in the morning. I got I've actually have found his CBDs in the morning. Really? <laughs> yeah, to, How uh, crazy! Yeah, I will take them in the morning to like loosen my shoulders, my elbows. Help you out. out. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be doing the job. Turn, yeah, just turn it to an advert for Supreme <laughs> CBD, and he felt I was getting all today. He, he, he owes us a bit of commission after that. I felt I want, I want, some, I want something sorted for that. Poo- you got the words of Poochie, the ultimate journeyman here, yeah. say, saying to get Supreme CBD. Uh, Poochie, I've got, I've got a quote here from you, mate. You described yourself as British boxing's biggest loser. So I, I don't know where that come from. Is I, that true? Because you had documentaries, still yeah. like so many people were interested in your story. I've, I've, I've done if I said it as a passing comment to a reporter once or something, but I don't really like that that term. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I sort of um, I actually done Radio Five Live on the build up to my last fight, and they call it me. And I was listening to them before. They don't know what they're talking about in terms of boxing, and they was almost mocking me. So I called them out on the broadcast. Did you? Yeah, straight up. Would you they, say that? Well. Um, so they, they, they obviously, you know, when you go on the radio, they, you're listening to the show. Before of course, you before go you do it, yeah. So, um, so he's going, oh yeah, this guy, bloody hell, 169 fights. He's only one thirteen, and then he starts going, oh, I wonder if I'll say if I laugh at his record, and then all like laughing at each other. So I like they put me on the broadcast. And I'm like, what's this spot? You said you're going to laugh at my record. So like, what's your credentials to be boxing to be having that sort of? Yeah. So, so I said, I'm not the biggest loser. How many fights have you had? Yes, and, right. and they got they got all defensive, and we continued the interview, and it was fine, and he was fine in the end. Not no no grudges out towards that reporter, by the way. But um, 171 <laughs> fights coming up. Let's get him on misfits with your spot of live report. Let's get him on there. See what happens. Let's see yeah. what happens. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, I just I refute the whole biggest loser thing. I, I, I think that's been misconstrued yeah. somewhere along the line. Um, the reporter that reported initially. That's a really good bloke, really nice fella. I think he's just mixed his words a little bit, and he's it's come back to 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 bite him a little bit. But because he got called out a few times on the internet by some mates, really as well. And uh, he, uh, again, no no grudges out towards the guy that that done the Absolutely. the thing. But yeah, I don't really like the whole biggest loser thing because I'm, I'm winning. <laughs> exactly, man. Yeah. Exactly. Do you do you find it weird? how interested people are in like your life your career your record i mean you know you get you know, some bell ends who say things the wrong way and stuff yeah, like yeah, that yeah. but it is a massively interesting story like i know to you you're just like i'm just poochie yeah. you know what i mean i work i work i, I go i get yeah. called up i do my fights and stuff but people are so interested in, in you know, does that feel weird to you or not so earlier on in my career when people started taking interest in me i always thought people were just taking a piss Really? On like social media, people would come in, oh yeah, pooch to this, pooch to that. And I always think, yeah, tongue in cheek, oh yeah. And that, But then as like my career drew on and people were asking me for pictures at venues and stuff, yeah. I, I started realising that people do actually have an interest in the away corner. So that's when I started pushed on and trying to make a name for other journeymen. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, just started like theming ring walks and stuff like that. I love it, man. Yeah. Honestly, I think it's funny that you you were in the ring so much. It's almost like, I don't know, tuning into Good Morning Britain every day. It's like, <laughs> it's like oh, Poochie's like, What time's Poochie on there? No matter what the boxing show is, we knew, yeah. we knew you was going to see you on yeah. there, right? What was the the highlight for you of your, in, in life in general? It doesn't have to be boxing. Yeah. What, what's been the highlight? Yeah, it's got to be boxing related, I think. It's got to yeah. be. Boxing, boxing was my identity. Still is, really. Mm-hmm. People know me as Poochie, as boxer. Um, I think I, the fight itself was was awful, and the, the ref stopped it in two rounds because I wasn't throwing enough punches back. But walking out of the O two, yeah, that was amazing. It was I was on I was on half past four. There's no one in there, mm. but I'm ring walking down the aisle at the O two. At the O two, yeah. What card was that on? It was Kevin Mitchell against oh, wow. Barroso, I think. Okay, okay, Barroso. Yeah, yeah. yeah someone like that. I think that was his name. Yeah, that. that um, and so I fell in love with boxing the day I walked into the gym and Ricky Hatton was on his rise. Um, that's probably the peak of his powers at the same time I saw was falling in love with boxing. Mm-hmm. So like uh, fighting at the MEN for a start, I yeah. fought there twice. That was great. Um, and I always idolised Ricky Hatton and I fought on a card he had um, one of his fighters on. Yeah, I went out for breakfast and he went, Poochie, all right, mate? And I, I, bet was, that was like, oh, I was like, I was like, oh my god, that's yeah. crazy. As a fighter yourself, as a like, fighter, like his, I, I was his biggest fan. Like, really, growing up, like I never, I only went to one of his fights because I was 
14, 15, I didn't have any money to go to Manchester on my own. Like, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I didn't I didn't really go to his fights when he was coming through. And then, um, yeah, I went to his retirement fight. Yeah, but even the fact that he knew who I was... It's it crazy. Absolutely, absolutely blew my mind. Have you ever been starstruck in the in the boxing world? Because obviously, yeah, that moment there with Ricky Hatton, was there anyone else you ever, you were ever like, oh, wow? Because trust me, what I've always been curious about, sometimes... I guess when you're in the ring, it's kind of like all consuming. You're focusing on your opponent. You've got, you've got yeah. to concentrate, right? But sometimes I'm watching a fight on TV and I'm like, flipping hell, they've got someone so sat yeah. there. They've got someone so sat there. The yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. you, when you're in the ring, do you ever notice people that yeah, like sat yeah, around definitely. the edge? I mean, like, for, like I said, the journeyman, the journeyman, um, the journeyman mindset is very different to the other corner. Yeah. The way corner dressing room is very relaxed and chilled. And we've done it so many times, like, Often you do lose a bit of concentration in this when you've done it so many times. If a fight's pretty easy, you have a little glance at ringside sometimes. Yeah. Or like ref says break and you sort of catch eyes with someone at ringside and you go, oh, oh yeah. That? Can you remember anyone that you've seen? Mark Marquez, one man by Marquez. Wow. I was on the, he was, he was managing the guy that fought Kevin Mitchell when I was on that show and I was just like, oh, oh hello. Yeah, you're right, mate. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy, man. And he was like, he was, um, he was like stood next to me at the weigh in as well. And I was like, I, I mentioned this before we went on air, but. I'm not, not much of a celebrity hounder. Yeah. I see a celebrity, I might say hello to him, but I'm not the one to get my phone out and take like a picture. Chase him yeah. I'm, I'd much rather have a conversation or just acknowledge, uh, hopefully they acknowledge me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just sort of went, nice to meet you, and you went, nice to meet you. Do you know what I feel really cool about that, Poochie, right? I think it's funny that you said you you saw me, like I was sitting in, God, it sounds so, you sound like such a dick, being like I was in one of the celeb sections, like the VIP yeah, sections yeah. at a couple of fights. And I remember I saw you from across the ring. I was sat down with one of, one of the other diversity boys. And I was like, that's, that's Poochie. That's Poochie. Because obviously I recognised you. I was like, this is like the journey. But by yeah. this point, I've, I've seen a couple of your docs. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like they've yeah. been coming out and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, that's Poochie. And I think it's funny how I feel like you don't see yourself in that sense. But there's no. a lot of people. Like you've got a lot of fans out there. Yeah. I remember when you announced your retirement, bro. Yeah, the off. amount of love yeah. that came your that way was from, really humbling for from me. loads of like boxing fans, but all the way up to like top of the game. Like, yeah. how did it feel to get all that all that support? Like, really, really, um, really overwhelming. Actually, I cried my eyes out the day I retired. Really? Yeah. Um, getting emotional. I think. No, man, I can, I can but, imagine, um, bro. Yeah, as uh, when the when the weeks building up to it, it was crazy. Like, Talksport were talking to me, um, Five Live, um, BBC Bristol. Um, all these outlets were getting hold of me, talking to me, and I found it all really like humbling. And then, and then like the the night of the the the, the, the second the final bow rang, I was burst into tears, burst into tears. And then uh, Chris Lloyd from the Zone had yeah. sorted out some uh, messages from some of the big names in the sport, and I'd, I'd had a few sherbets by the time I got home. <laughs> so I'm just sat on the end of a bed, just like crying my eyes out that that the these figureheads which I admire yeah. and look up to and are in the sport at the top of the sport I love I've acknowledged who I am and I just found it found it really really overwhelming I think it's awesome bro because like you said you're getting emotional there boxing is obviously a massive part of your life Yeah, I think it was nice to see people saying what they said you know from your, your Tony Bellews to your Cole Framptons to even yeah. people like you know still, still current fighters like Jordan Gill Jordan Gilles, you man, know yeah, yeah man uh, it, it was nice to see because you have brought so much to the sport, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, journeyman, that term doesn't normally get like a massive amount of respect on it. Do you know what I mean? People use it as like a bit of a, derog a derogatory term, a little bit of a slur. But the fact that you sort of shown on light on the job you guys do, which is essentially, you know, to see some of these prospects know that like you've learned, like you've taught them something in the ring, yeah, yeah. you've given them that experience that they kind of needed is awesome. But now you're kind of giving back to boxing in more ways than one, right? Like new career path on the horizon. What's happening with that? So um, I'm now a trainee referee. That's awesome, bro. Yeah, because I chose that path because boxing is a drug, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't want to go cold turkey. Yeah. From boxing, I didn't want to. I didn't want to just completely disappear from boxing, not be have go to boxing shows. Whilst I probably should have gone to watch them, it's not the same. You're not involved. Yeah. In my yeah, opinion. Yeah. Um. So, uh, I didn't want to be a trainer. I mentioned earlier, my shoulders, my elbows are a bit knackered. So holding the pads was, was never going to interest me. And the time I've given up best part of my, my life 
to boxing, having to go to the gym in the evenings because I've got a fight on the weekend. And I just didn't want to give that time. I couldn't give that time to a prospect mm -hmm. coming through or, couldn't, or another journeyman. I could not have give that time to him. So I was never going to ever do that just to let someone down. So I just thought I've got a lot of experience in the ring. There's subtle things in the ring which fighters see, especially like and uh, experienced referees will see him, but referees have, yeah. have not um, boxed before might not see him. And I just thought it was a good career path. I get to stay in boxing. I get to watch boxing for free at ringside. Mm -hmm. get to sell, I get some of the biggest shows. Um, and it, it satisfies my crave my craving for boxing and I honestly honestly get the same buzz sat ringside really doing these scorecards and I as I did when I was fighting myself I was gonna say do you feel like that's like you said it's not something you could have fully left because it, no. it, it's part of you right 100% you fought 170 times it was it a 10 year career 10 years 10, yeah. year, 10 years you fought over a 10 year career and you're like it must be impossible to just go all right then cheers yeah. I'm just gonna go back I'm just gonna go get a nine to five and that like nothing ever happened yeah literally I, I, I like I said it's a bit I don't want to go cold turkey I love boxing and there's no, there's no part of me that ever wanted to just walk away and just disappear into obscurity. I wanted to keep my name relevant and stay in the boxing. And eventually I'll be the third man in the ring at some of the biggest events in the world. Yes, mate. So that's that's the goal. The I'm, I'm curious, the the process, because am I, am I right in saying this, that if you're a referee, you also have to judge, judge, referee. Yeah. Like that's that's the yeah. way it works, right? Same, same, same bracket. Same bracket. So <clears throat> do you, how... You're a trainee official now. What's the process? How long does it take? I know, like you, there's different grades. Like, what's the process for you? So it's quite a long process, and you've got to be really committed to it because mm -hmm. you just you don't get paid at the start of it. You're doing it purely for the love of the sport. And so, at you go trainee referee, which is who I am now. Then you go trial referee, which is the trial referee is the um, referee in the ring making all the in ring decisions, but it's it's judged on a scorecard by an official A star referee. Right, okay. Inside. Then once they deem you uh, ready to go on to the next level, you get a B licence, so you're refing, scoring all the undercard fights. Mm -hmm. Anything under 10 rounds you get to do. Wow. Yeah, and There's some big fights still then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then and then, uh, 10 rounds onwards, you need an A, a licence referee, world title fights, A star referee. So you get the, the whole process to get to A star, depending on your experience and stuff, um, you're probably looking at 10 years, 15 10 years. years. Do you think that having the experience you already do in the ring will not say fast track you, but I mean, in terms of you already, it won't delay your progress. You think it's going to help you? I, I, I'd like to think so. Yeah. I, I can't say for certain. Um, but I do think that my, my, uh, experience inside the boxing industry, because I think part of the trainee proce uh, process is seeing how a fight night works. Yep. For some people have never been involved in it so obviously i've been doing that for years yeah so I've, I've got that side of it i know how it all works then it's just translating my experience as a fighter into being the man inside the ring uh the third man inside the ring and uh and using that experience good as a as a fighter now obviously as a as a trainee <coughs> referee official being involved with the british board I've got to ask you, man. It's a bit of a, a bit of a squeaky bum time question, right? Yeah. But you know, you watch some fights and you go, "How the hell? Yeah, has it been scored like that? Yeah. You've been on all sides of this now. So you would have been in the ring as a fighter. You know, trying to become a referee. You're going to have to judge. You're going to have been. You're going to have seen this from every angle as a viewer, as a participant, yeah. as every. Do you sometimes see how those mistakes can be made, or do, or do you sit there with your head in your hands like how? So. Um, the casual boxing fans might not understand the vantage point that each judge has got from the ringside. Yeah. So for those who don't know, there's three different vantage points just around the ring. There's one, two, three judges, right? So each judge is getting a completely different view. Mm -hmm. Whilst they're watching the same fight, they might see something differently from a different angle. And if it can be quite close and both fighters are tip for tat, those that's where the swing rounds come in, like Taylor... Lopez on the weekend. Yeah, exactly. That yeah, 115, yeah, 113, two of the cards, which I thought was a bit favourable to Taylor. I didn't think he won. Um, it was quite, yeah, they made that sound quite close. Yeah. He, 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 I think like he started the fight quite strong. Yeah. But towards that, you know, I think I'll say from like round four onwards, it was, it was Theo's fight, really. 100%. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, so there's, but there's a few rounds in there which could have, Taylor, uh, Taylor was catching some nice counters, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then Theo was making a miss. So 
but boxing is very subjective in the scoring aspect. It's very much what you like. There's no one size fits all scoring criteria. Yeah. There's no go away and learn that. Yeah, exactly. Pamphlet. Yeah. There's nothing like that. It's I, very do, much... I do think that's the hard one, bro, because I completely agree with you in terms yeah. of it. it is subjective. You know, I quite like sometimes like when when people are quite cute at their work you know they're slipping shots they might land a couple of counts they might not land loads of meaningful shots but they're, they're nice with their work you know i've got friends who sit there go no way like they like a come forward fire he's yeah. frying shots he's like, might get we'll we'll, t we'll take one to give two you know they, yeah. they like that so you might sometimes score rounds a bit differently i get that subjectively but i do feel like there's sometimes where you go mate i can't see any other way this yeah. has happened because you you watch it sometimes and you, you listen to you listen to com even commentators they're all yeah. working on the same show and they're laying into the refs or they're yeah. laying into judges yeah, and yeah. stuff like that and it's like it makes you feel like someone's had a flipping envelope slid under their door yeah, Do you yeah. know what i mean like honestly like it's crazy to think because there's so many regulations and stuff in boxing i do feel like it kind of gets i don't know if i want to say unfair but it does get a bit of a rap for being corrupt like you yeah. hear it a lot and i'm like being I, this is why i want to ask you because all I've done is go to a lot of live shows, watch a lot of the events live and watch it on TV. And yeah. I had the privilege to be able to talk to fighters like yourself and people in the sport, but it doesn't mean I'm directly involved. So do you feel like all those talks about corruption and this and fixing it, do you think it's all crap or do you think there's anything in it ever? No, there's, de there's never anything in it. Like, I've, again, I'm pretty new on this side of the, of the ropes, so I don't really know the ins and outs of it, but I 100% say that the British Boxing Board themselves of course. are definitely not in, in line of any corruption. It's all very fair. And it feels like that with a lot of it. I guess it's just you get to some fights where you go, I just don't see how they saw it. But I guess, like you said, for you, I think it's going to be really interesting. Mate, Poochie, we could be sat here in two years' time. I could be like, mate, what was your card <laughs> about, Poochie? What was you yeah. watching? What have you yeah. done? Does that ever worry you? Or do you, because do you know what would really, like, I, I would think it sounds quite funny now. Of course, it's being good at your job. But if you scored a fight, you know, you went, oh, you know, I've given it, uh, let me think, 115, 130 in one way. Yeah. And someone goes, well, I scored it 116, 112. And every other judge has gone the other way. Yeah. I'd be sat there like, oh, I'm <laughs> mess this one up. Yeah. Does that ever worry you? Or do you think it's a case of, no, look, I, I score it from my perspective. Yeah. I do my job, and I that's think that's, that. I think that's the way you gotta be. Like, and that's the that's the stance I'll take. People have made jokes about, "Oh, you're gonna favour the wayfire." I said, "Absolutely not. I'll be very fair. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll score what I see, and that's that's the only way I can. That's the only way I can progress moving forward, anyway. So that's exactly what I do. Yeah, man. Any uh, any regrets for your career? Anything you wish you would have done differently? Because I know you've uh, got a lot of love now, and it's wicked looking back. And like I said, you're a very, very positive person, which I think yeah. is awesome. But is there anything you, is, is there any regret? I mean, there was times I probably could have lived a bit, bit of a better lifestyle. So maybe that a little bit. Probably could have put a few better performances on. Because um, like I said, I like beer and fast food. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I work long hours. Can't be bothered to go to the gym sometimes. <laughs> so so literally I've gone in the ring and been a complete shell on myself sometimes. Should yeah. not have been in there. So maybe, maybe live the life a little bit better. Do you think it's funny how, because I do, listening to you, mate, it's so funny hearing someone who's had 170 professional fights, yeah. fought some of the best prospects in, in Britain, had some, like, fought at the MEN, the O2, and say, oh, there were some days when I thought, oh, I can't bother to go to jail, I'm not going, I'm going to have a beer. But it's the same as any job, though. Some some days you can't be bothered to, like, build bricklayers. Yeah. Some days they love it because the sun's out, but mm -hmm. then when it's pouring with rain, they definitely don't want to go to work. Don't want to be doing that. Yeah. So do you ever see, like, because obviously we all watch, we all watch the interviews, we watch the fight weeks, we see the press conferences, and sometimes I think, mate, you have got to be lying, where yeah. they're like, you know, I missed the birth of my first son, yeah. and I, I got offered the lottery, and I said no, because I wanted to be <laughs> in the gym, and I'm like, surely not, man. Like, no, man. come on. Like, you must, do you, like, as someone who's been involved so much, watch it and think, that can't be true. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. But I don't know that they're chasing something. I wasn't. Yeah, so, true. I suppose. So I, I wasn't chasing anything. I realised quite early on that I wasn't gonna uh, pursue that side of the boxing. Do you so, under, do you understand that from them though? Like when people are so like, so obviously we sp I spoke to Anthony Fowler, right? And from his amateur career, he was so one track minded. Yeah. Like, you know, for years and years and years, he was like, nothing went into my body apart from clean food. Mm -hmm. He was like, maybe after a fight, I'd have one or two drinks, but you know, that's it. Um, ate clean, lived clean, friends are going out around him. No, I'm not going this and that. 
do you understand why people can be that dedicated? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I I was when I was younger. Um, my amateur career, I was very very dedicated because mm-hmm. I, I I wasn't. I, I learned on the job, and whilst I learned quite quickly, I was still very raw when I when I first had my first amateur fight. I used to love it. Like, I used to eat sweets and spit them out. Yeah. And stuff like that. Whilst my mates are having sweets and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, and obviously I'm learning on the job, yeah. all that sort of stuff. And when I first turned pro, I was ridiculously dedicated. Mm-hmm. Three times a day, sparring with Selby and stuff like that. It's but crazy. then, but then, um, yeah, then that, once I realised I wasn't going to be a world beater mm-hmm. and it was probably all going to be for nothing, if I went, if I carried on that way, then I, that's when I decided to embrace my 20s. Just, just live, just live life. Just live Have life. A bit of life, yeah. Because I, I think a lot of pro fighters they, they don't, and I do think it's kind of sad. It's nice to see Pucci that you've ended your career, and you've still got one a massively positive outlook, and two, to still see you involved in the sport. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of fighters, a lot of un, you know, some fighters who, you know, maybe weren't on big, big TV contracts or weren't doing this or weren't doing that, and they kind of end their career and they sort of fade away, and just they struggle to adjust to a normal life. Yeah. And I think it's hard because you get some sportsmen who like um, some athletes, like footballers, they fade away out of the limelight, but at least they had the money there to back them up. I yeah. think for some boxers to not have the financial security, but to also lose those highs. That, yeah. Like you said, boxing's a drug. To lose those highs and still have no money out of it. it don't you think it's... It's kind of sad to see how some boxers turn when they finish fighting. Hundred percent, hundred percent. It is very sad, but everyone's got their own stuff going on. Mm. I had a bit of a mental health wobble st- whilst I was still fighting, actually. Really? Yeah, but I, I, I actually used boxing to get myself over it. Um, yeah, but everyone's got their own demons going on. It's just how, how you deal with it, and yeah, but it's it is sad when you see fighters. Um, Going off the rails and stuff, but even ones that did have money and stuff after yeah. their career, I guess because they're chasing that that yeah. feeling still. Because of course, look, I've said it before, our, our careers are massively different. But no matter what I do, I love. You know, I've got a radio show. I love doing on that. I love interviewing people. I love boxing. I love going to the shows. I think the reason why I love watching boxing so much, right, is I'm not comparing myself to a fighter because I think it's a completely different mindset mm-hmm. in every aspect. But when I walk out on stage. And people are screaming your name yeah, yeah, and like yeah. enjoying what you do. That rush, the rush of adrenaline, yeah, dude. Like, there's nothing like it, and I can't imagine then applying that to, not to sound too dramatic here, like a fight for survival almost. Yeah. If you don't, if you if you're not switched on, you, you are getting hurt. You got to control it. You got to, you got to stay calm, with your mind in the right place. At the same time, taking all that, mm-hmm. that um, uh, that nervous energy. And atmosphere and adrenaline and use it to your advantage. Yeah, that's yeah. the that's the tricky bit of boxing because you hear it all the time. Gym fighters, yeah, they're hundred, but they're, they're they're world beaters in the in the gym. When the bright lights are on, they just freeze. They they haven't got they it. Can't do it. They can't do it. Your last fight, Poochie. When you knew it was going to be your last fight, yeah. The camp, the fight week, the build up, everything about it. Did it feel different? Um, yeah, but only because. I decided to retire on Boxing Day, ironically. Okay. I was I just I was speaking to my dad, went for a pint with my dad. I said, I think I'm done. And he went, Oh yeah, you reckon? I said, yeah, I said, I'd never pulled out of a fight in my life, but about two weeks before Christmas, I woke up in the morning and I rang Rich and I went, I'm not doing it tonight. Hmm. Not fighting tonight, can't be bothered, not up for it. Was you injured or you just felt like I just, just, can't, be just couldn't be bothered. Really? Just couldn't be bothered. Just I wasn't up for it. I didn't I did, the fight was in like Barnsley or something. I didn't want to drive all the way up there for a start. Then the thought of doing a six rounder which wasn't exciting me. So then I went, pull me out of the fight. I've got a replacement. Robbie Chapman's gonna step in. Um yeah, so then so then the fight was scheduled for March twenty fifth. So I had like best part well, over three months to think about it. Mm. And and uh so I was three months to think about it, it's just definitely gonna be my last one. And I decided it was. Then it was like I didn't do a training camp as such, I still got a normal job. So I just like I said, I went to the gym if I could, I had the time, could be bothered, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, so then not fighting for three months before my fight my my, my last fight. Probably the longest break you had in it, but yeah, it was well well, apart from COVID. Yeah, COVID of course, was eighteen yeah. months. Yeah, but um 
yeah, it was, it was, that, that was a bit odd. That was a bit odd. It was like, I've got a license, I can keep fighting if I want to. Yeah. But I don't want to. Like the, if the, I, I told Rich to not even tell me if anyone rang to ask for me. Really? So he didn't. So then, uh, the, the, that, that, I was chatting about this to some mates on the weekend. I was, some of my mates come to the, the last fight, but I've not seen them since. I said, I've not seen him since last fight. How are you feeling about it? I was like, the night just sort of passed me by. Really? Like, because it was, I was such, like, so much love going on. And I got there, there was a bit of a kerfuffle with the tickets because the bus driver had, had got the wrong bus or something. Mm. And all my tickets were on the bus he should have taken. Oh. <laughs> so all my fans didn't have tickets. So I had to run and get them. So that was that was a bit stressful. And then I, I got there. I was like, because I sold quite a lot of tickets, they put me on just before the main event. So, um... I was at the chain. I was in the changes for hours. People coming in, talking to me, and it was it was great. I was just sat chatting, chatting with Rich, chatting with Claudia, chatting to the guys that shot a documentary. I was just chatting with them, chatting to people coming in and out of the changing rooms, and then as soon as the fight started, the the, the changing rooms area felt like a lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I was nervous or anything. It was just more. I've been up there. For, I've probably been there for five hours. Yeah, wow. Just waiting for a fight. Yeah, yeah. And then as soon as the fight started, it just bypassed me. The night bypassed me. The next thing, you know, I'm sat on the end of my bed crying at videos from Tony Bell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, you, do you look back at that night and, like, I'm guessing, obviously, you really tried to win, right? Yeah. Because cool, it was your last fight. Yeah. That's why I asked about, was the build-up different? Because for some fights, like you said, you'd be out. Of course, you know it's not the last time. You're yeah, going, yeah. okay, yeah, I'll take the fight. A week's notice, I'll do this, I'll do that. Yeah. I feel like that must have been like a really a really emotional time like i probably would have been crying on the way to the ring because like, it's yeah. been such a big part of your life he's taught yeah. you so many life lessons he's giving you so much to do all this stuff um go go into the ring for that last fight when you was physically fighting did did you have to think about a lot was it a scary fight for you was you like, or did it feel like every other one no, not really not really i wasn't scared or anything the result was irrelevant it was nice to win and i did um but yeah i was just focused on the fight really so yeah. the, I've, I've said this before to people, and people can't really comprehend it. But the be the bell in a fight is like hypnotism, because like you, once you're not hypnotized, yeah. that sound of that bell means fight time, mm -hmm. and you're automatically honed in on what you, you're focusing on. And uh, ever since my first amateur fight, I've always been like that. Seconds out, ding, and Green. I'm and I'm focused. And then whilst I, like, like I said, mentioned earlier, I might deviate and lose a bit of concentration, but most of the time... You're locked in. Just locked in, especially like when I've got people there watching and supporting me. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that and it was my last one. I just wanted to take it all in and enjoy it. Well, Poochie, I want to say, mate, it's been a it's been an honour to have you on A Fighter's Life. You, If anyone deserves to be on here, mate, it is you. Talking about resilience yeah. and sticking at something and, you know, I think you personify a fighter in a lot of ways. Is there anything you want to say to everyone who supported you for so long? All the, all the words of love that you got given when you retired. I'll, I'll leave it to you. Anything you want to say? Yeah, obviously, I just want to thank everyone, everyone who ever supported me. Um, the love I've got from the boxing community has been second to none. Like coming on podcasts and like this and stuff is is very humbling. Obviously, the biggest thanks goes to Richard. He was there from my third fight onwards. Wow. So we did 167 fights together. And he managed me for most of my career too. So him, him especially. And yeah, I've, I've enjoyed the ride and uh, I wouldn't have done it any other way. Pucci, you're a legend, mate. Best of luck with the with the referee as well. Cheers, George. I'm sure yeah, you're going to smash it, mate. Yeah. And when you do stop refing and judging, no dodgy scorecards, bro. <laughs> I'll have you straight back on here, Pucci. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Cheers, George. Nice one.